you're taking an entirely online course and your professor wants to give you an exam, uh, they'll have, often they'll have some software that is meant to uh, prevent cheating, prevent academic dishonesty. They'll think software like Proctorio. Now, there has been a lot of evolution in this type of software. So traditional proctoring systems that came around in the, in the 2000s were centered around locking down the browser or computer. They would force you to keep the software open or to keep the tab or uh, browser page open. Of course, these these always had one fatal flaw in that students could just cheat by having a book in their lap or they could uh, just have another computer altogether. Maybe I have this monitor hooked up to a desktop and they have this monitor hooked up to a uh, laptop or something. And, you know, you can just uh, people can get around the software that way. So, uh, but of course the exam proctoring software providers, they wanted to attract more clients. They wanted to have something they could tell, you know, schools and universities like, okay, we are absolutely sure we'll prevent students from cheating. And so they had the brilliant idea of adding eye tracking algorithms to their software packages. And uh, many of y'all are currently in school or have uh, been in school in the last few years. You may be familiar with some of these. They'll not only require you to uh, keep the exam that you're taking online uh, locked, you know, lock down the computer, prevent it from opening other programs or tabs. Um, they'll also try to do eye tracking. So like they'll actually, you know, that th they'll require you to have a camera on that the software will tell you that uh, you must stay looking just right at the computer screen. And the idea is that if you're looking, if you're spending a lot of time, instead of looking at the camera or looking at the monitor that the exam is taking place on. So at least the idea they had was if we can't, if we can't keep people from, you know, uh, using a another computer or a, a textbook while they're taking the exam, we will just directly track their eyeballs so that we can see, uh, to, so we can make sure they're looking at the exam and nothing else. Interesting idea, but like anything, the devil is in the details and the implement, implementation is where things quickly went off the rails. So think about eye tracking. Again, uh, Proctorio and some other providers, they wanted to add eye tracking to their software. Now think about eye tracking. This task is trivial for a human to perform. Uh, following the path of another human being's eyes is fairly easy. Like, uh, you know, if I'm looking at, I'm, I mean, you look at my face right now. Uh, if I'm looking here, 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 it's pretty easy for you to follow the eyes of another human being. Um, you know, it's just something we innately know how to do. So Proctorio wanted to, du to duplicate this human ability and make sure that test takers looked at the screen at all times while they were taking their exams. Well, uh, good in theory, but how did they actually create that software? Well, uh, something like that, again, is too complicated to ever have to have any hope of ever manually programming. It had to be created through a machine learning process. And like all of the things we've talked about, if you want to do that, you need to set, you need to have a set of training data. Well, where do you get a set of training data? Well, you know, there may be some open source set of eye tracking um, data set uh, of eye tracking uh, example data out there that you could use. Uh, but most of all, most likely they probably had to create it. Um, let's think about this. You get a bunch of people, you sit them down in front of computers, uh, you take images of some of them looking at the screen and you have some of them, you take images of some of them looking away from the screen. So in some of the images, they're looking directly at the screen like this or like this. And in some, they're looking like this, like this, like this, like this. They're looking away from the screen. And you use that data set to train your eye tracking algorithm. Um, fair enough, seems good in theory. But uh, of course, the real world is far more complicated and, and diverse than whatever's and whatever training data they used. It's, it's quite possible that Proctorio or some, some of these other companies, it, when they were developing their training data, they went for the most convenient set of uh, source of training data available, which would be images created from their own employees. So maybe they'd use that to, maybe they use their own employees to create their training data set. Maybe they use just, you know, random people they found on the street and they use something like that to develop a set of training data. And then they use that to, to develop their um, uh, eye tracking software. Uh, seems simple enough. Where could things go wrong? well, you know, where this is going. In the pandemic, a lot of universities uh, really had to very hastily move to software like Proctorio on a large scale without really properly vetting it. So 
prior to the pandemic, a lot of schools had neglected to properly really develop their online teaching tools and practices. And suddenly, because the whole world shut down, they were forced to do a rush job of it and not necessarily properly, you know, vet all of the software and tools they were using in their sudden rollout of mass scale online teaching. There are ways to design courses that optimize for online content delivery that don't require you to do these really invasive, like eye tracking uh, type of exams. There are other ways to do this, um, but they didn't have enough time to do that proper planning and vetting. Uh, so they were stuck with their high stakes exam model uh, that was really optimized for in-person in teaching. And so they were really, really desperate for any way to give exams for their online courses uh, in the same way they, they would give high stakes exams for their in-person courses. And then I kind of imagine this like, uh, I'm sure it didn't exactly happen like this, but in my mind, it kind of works like there's this like flim flam man walking into town, you know, practicing uh, promising these like miracles on the back of digital gods. I just have this image of like um, Lyle Landley, singing salesman in the famous uh, monorail episode of The Simpsons, who comes to Springfield to uh, sell them a monorail uh, to fix all the town's problems. Imagine Proctorio uh, coming in and uh, making their pitch to all, their, all the uh, universities during pandemic era. Uh, like, uh, you have this problem with exams and you need to deliver these exams. And we have this amazing advanced eye tracking software that'll take care of all of your problems. And it'll put your university on the map just like Springfield or something. But uh, anyway, the colleges, and, the colleges and universities were desperate, so they signed up without vetting and testing the systems properly. What could go wrong? Well, as you can imagine, there were some problems, and it didn't take long for the inevitable issues you know, to rear their ugly head. Uh, first of all, there were, just like in a lot of the other systems we talked about, there was a lot of uh, a lot of racial bias issues in the eye tracking software. It's hard to say where that came from, probably just from an improperly diverse set of training data. In other words, they didn't make they didn't put a lot of effort into making sure that when they were designing this data set that they, uh, you know, made sure to have people of all ethnic and racial groups in their that training data set, or at least insufficient numbers of them. So there were a lot of issues with um, racial disparities in the eye tracking software. Uh, there are also issues with students with various disabilities having problems with the software. Uh, basically, the problem is ultimately that the companies could not possibly have a, a set of training data large enough to encompass all the types of students that might end up using the software. And while they, I'm sure they tested it, they also don't have infinite budgets to test against all different types of people who might need to use the software so they couldn't test everything properly. They had taught their software that a human being, when they are looking at a screen, looks a certain way. When a human being is looking dead to the camera, you know, directly at the camera, they look a certain way. And people who fell outside of that data set were simply not counted as human beings who are looking at a screen. And so again, garbage in, garbage out. If your eye tracking software is based on an incomplete data set, a data set that does not represent the entire population, then your final tool will not be uh, equally accurate or equally applicable to the enti entire population. And the Proctorio eye tracking software is found Oh boy, this is this is a really bad one. Was found to make one error that managed to transcend, somehow rise, ascend above even normal racial bias. And this system wanted to ascend not only to not only to to be uh, abhorrent and evil, but wanted to like arise to the level of a cartoonishly evil Disney villain. And I don't know if you've heard of this case before, but that's the only way I can describe it. Just like a cartoonishly evil Disney villain. Uh, students started report that. Um, Proctorio's eye tracking software was flagging them for cheating because they were crying. <sighs> yes, they were saying that as the, uh, you know, the, the system, as they're taking their exam, you know, it's tracking their eye movements, making sure that they're looking at the screen and they are looking at the screen, but they're frustrated. They can't solve a problem. They are, you know, dealing with the pandemic stress. They signed up for an in-person class, et cetera, and, and they're taking an online one. They're sitting there in literally in tears and the stupid computer is telling them they're cheating. Again, this is at the height of the pandemic. Students are quite understandably, you know, going through a pretty traumatic period. Uh, students 
who had never intended to take online classes and actually paid full price for in-person courses instead of like the discounted courses you often get online, were suddenly foisted in very slap together online courses taught by professors who had never taught an online course before in their life. You know, the, the students hadn't, hadn't intended to teach an online course, the professors hadn't intended to teach an online course, and everyone just caught in this, pl this web together trying to make the best of it. And, you know, they were, they were often taught with substandard tools and methods, and they were forced to take these high stakes exams using invasive and poorly designed eye tracking software. And when some inevitably came to succumb to the pressure and literally broke down into tears in an exam, the bastard software flagged them as cheating. <sighs> this is why I called this section the uh, may man and machine be forgiven for their sins. So why did this happen? Uh, were the engineers of Proctorio like mustache twirling villains gleefully laughing at the tears of students? Well, it is Proctorio, so quite possibly, but uh, more realistically, like all of this, it's garbage in, garbage out. Remember, a machine is not a human being. If you are looking me straight in the eye, I can tell that you're doing it, that you're doing so. You know, I can tell if someone is looking me in the eye and all I can do, and, and I can do that in all sorts of lighting conditions. I can do that for all sorts of people, regardless of the shape, their shapes, you know, for all, uh, for all kinds of people of all shapes and sizes, ages and races, gender or disability. Even if you're missing one eye or you, ha you have like mismatched eye colors, or even if you have tears in your eyes, I can still quickly tell if you are looking me in the eye or not. Um, I can do this. Why? Um, I'm not, I don't have some sort of superpower, I'm just a human being. And the reason I can do that is that there are entire portions of the human brain that are dedicated to interpreting human faces. We are social creatures. If I take a single human being and drop them alone in the savanna or the jungle, you know, naked with nothing, you know, on them, they're going to be dead in a few days, if that. You know, we are creatures that have evolved to work as a team, to work as units. We've, in our natural environment, we evolved to work in, you know, to live and work in small bands and groups. And eventually we grew into like, you know, eventually we grew into civilizations and big societies and nations and everything. But we are social beings. We have to know how to communicate with one another. This is just part of being human. We are social beings. So there are entire portions of the human brain dedicated to interpreting the human face. We even have the ability to, the innate ability to see which, what each other are looking at. You know, we have portions of the brain uh, dedicated to determining the emotional state of someone, uh, sometimes to, to determine, you know, the veracity of someone, if someone's being sarcastic, joking, maybe even lying. Uh, we have portions of the brain dedicated to that. And we have portions of the brain dedicated to determining where another person is looking, whether you're looking directly at the person, whether you're looking to the left, to the right, up and down, etc. Uh, we have that ability. It's like before we developed theory, modern theories of light and optics, there was actually for a time a quite prominent and quite widely accepted theory that our eyes worked not by like taking light into them, that, you know, light rays from the sun, but that we actually had some, almost like our eyes had little laser beams that went out of our eyes. I mean, seriously, like you can look this up. It's pretty crazy. But this is actually a prominent theory for a while. And we still actually reference this, you know, and there's a bit of cultural memory uh, at play when we use expressions like the light of your eyes or, you know, under your gaze. The reason people came up with that was because, you know, human beings have such a good ability to tell where each other are looking. If I want you to look at something, I don't even need to directly tell you, look over there. I can just look over there. If I'm looking over in this direction, you almost almost involuntarily, once you see me looking at something, especially if I don't tell you anything about it, if I'm just like, for some reason, staring over at a certain direction, you are almost involuntarily compelled to do so. I can just stare, you know, I can just stare at a spot in a room that we're both in and without uttering a single word, I can get you to look at that as well. Again, almost involuntarily, you will trace the path from my eyes to see what you're, what I am looking at and your eyes will follow that path. It's almost like a superpower we have. It is really this, a form of nonverbal communication that we have. You can imagine that was probably very useful back in like hunter gatherer days. There's a hunter uh, out on the plains uh, or a savanna somewhere and you want to uh, inform one of your uh, tribe mates, uh, hey, there is a gazelle over there that we're trying to capture or hunt. But if I shout, hey, there's a gazelle over there, that gazelle is gonna hear my voice, get startled and run away. But instead, if I just look over there, then you can follow that path 
and see what I see. It is this really cool form of nonverbal communication that we have, and very few species have anything like it. We are social creatures built from the ground up to subtly communicate and understand each other on a level really few other uh, creatures can even begin to approach. Um, actually, it's one of those interesting things that uh, dogs, uh, you know, canines, dogs are actually so special because they're one of the few animals that can participate in some of this more subtle nonverbal communication. Um, you know, I actually consider myself more of a cat person, but I will note that unlike cats, which really can't do this, dogs actually can follow your line of sight. Um, and, you know, if, if you point at something, uh, a dog is actually smart enough uh, to be able to look in the direction that you're pointing. If you try that with a cat, well, okay, knowing cats, it's quite possible that they know that you want them to look over there, but they simply refuse to do it out of spite, but uh, dogs will actually do it. Uh, they're called, you know, man's best friend for a reason. But what's, what's really happening is that we've been living and working together, you know, we've been living and working with dogs you know, for such an immense period of time, tens of thousands of years, that really our brains have been able to co-evolve with each other to the point that we're, that they are to a degree intercompatible. Like, it's not wild that um, we are completely different species, not even very closely related, just the fact that we're both mammalian species, but we have been living together and interacting with canines, with dogs, so long that we have evolved the ability for our brains to be a little bit intercompatible. Anyway, I just think that's kind of cool. And ultimately, this is just a tiny drop in the ocean that is human nonverbal communication. Um, for example, the human eye uh, isn't simply a camera. It's actually almost like a monitor as well, a screen. It is a display. So again, when I look left, right, up and down, uh, you know, side to side or directly at the camera here, you can tell where I'm looking. But think about that. There are parts of the brain dedicated to this, but it's also built into the structure of our eye. Um, notice we have very distinctly colored irises, uh, you know, of various colors depending on your family, you know, genetics and such. And then we have this white region around the iris, the sclera. And why do we have that? Why not just like a uniform color? Wouldn't that be easier? You know, just evolutionarily speaking, why not just have a single color across the entire eye except for the actual, you know, people where the light itself enters the eye? You know, wouldn't that be easier? Your eyes are built in such a way that other human beings can see what you're looking, what you look at. Isn't that wild? Your eyes are literally giving away deliberately, well, in an evolutionary sense, what you're looking at. It is impossible for you to look at something without instructing other human beings what you are looking at. I don't know. I think that's pretty pretty wild. Um, so. Again, you cannot look at something, the, the human eye is meant not only to see, but to be seen. The eye itself is a form of nonverbal communication or a delivery mechanism for that. You can't look at something without giving cues to other humans that something might be worth looking at. Again, you are a social being built to live in a group of other humans and constantly consciously and subconsciously share information back and forth. That is our superpower as a species. Human beings don't have, you know, really powerful teeth. We can't run really fast, although we can talk about like persistence running and stuff and that theory. But, uh, you know, we can't run as fast as a cheetah. We don't have the claws of a bear or the strength of a bear or anything like that. You know, in terms of physical strength and abilities, humans are pretty weak uh, compared to most other animals. But the one superpower we really do have that has allowed us to, you know, take over the entire planet is that we are social creatures. We are able to plan together. We are able to work together. We are able to build together. And that is what has allowed us to do everything that we have done for good or for ill. So, uh, okay, that with that uh, rant about, you know, human history and human nature aside, Consider the uh, just the sheer evolutionary immensity that has gone into, into the human ability to track what other people or other human beings are link, looking at. And then along comes Proctorio. They come along full of hubris and they try to reproduce this human ability to track other humans' eye uh, movements. They had the arrogance to think that they, this one company, could do this cheaply and duplicate what is really a masterpiece of nature. They're like a kindergartner trying to duplicate, you know, Da Vinci's Last Supper with finger paint, or, you know, or Michelangelo's David with Play-Doh. They're you know, fools trying to create in a week what took nature a billion years to master. 
And then they try to pass off this clumsy imitation uh, off as the equivalent of the real thing. They create this pale imitation of the real, real thing and then just foist it upon the public. Well, ultimately, this is an intractable problem. If there is a bias in your training data, it doesn't matter what elaborate training algorithm and statistical methods you use to you know, train your final um, program or algorithm. Garbage in, garbage out. It is easy to make the mistake and think uh, things that we as human beings can do trivially, you know, like knowing where a person is looking, uh, must be simple tasks. It's always going to be very tempting to think. If this is you know, a trivial task for me, it must be simple for a computer to do as well. But again, when you do this, you ignore that the human mind is the most powerful computational device in the known universe. And we dedicate most of that immense capability to really ordinary everyday tasks that we do just existing as humans in a human world and a human society. Your mind is more powerful than the grandest you know, supercomputers we've ever built. Um, and you use most of that capability just living your life. This is the core challenge of any machine learning system meant to duplicate human capabilities. If you're building a machine learning system to do something that humans can't do easily, for say, for example, like sorting through massive data sets, then you're really less prone to this uh, methodological error. If you want to train a machine to do something that's difficult for humans, then you're less likely to make, I think you're less likely to make the error of thinking that something's probably going to be easy when it's actually hard. But when you build a machine learning algorithm to duplicate something humans find easy, a danger will always exist that you might vastly underestimate the sheer complexity of the task involved. You think a task is simple and you end up creating a machine that is but a poor imitation of human capability.